The temptation is to generate the quick money, to fix it, flip, to buy and sell, to keep moving because it feels like velocity is profit. But when you're a 1031 investor, velocity is the enemy of lifetime gain. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Dave Foster. Dave's a qualified intermediary for 1031 exchanges and founder of the 1031 Investor. He's a multi-industry visionary and has 25 years of experience in real estate investing. So um, as I mentioned before, Dave, there's there's a, a ton of um, you know good stuff in your bio, but I think it's always better when people hear it from you, from your from your mouth. Uh, but first, thank you for coming on the show today. Thanks for taking the time out. I know we're we're sort of across coasts, but uh, also both not too far from the ocean. Exactly. It's great to be here today with you. I'm excited. Appreciate it. Um, well, why don't you just tell the listeners about yourself, their background, kind of, you know, what, what brought you to where you are today? Sure. You know, I got to tell you, by the way, and I, I think I mentioned it right before the cast, but of all the podcasts that I've been on, I love your show the most. The title of it, it, it fits so well, basically, into my story. Um, awesome. Know your why. And I don't know if you've received my book yet, but it's on the way. Yep. I just actually it. just got it, like, I think two days ago. It, it Beautiful. Thank you very Lifetime much. Lifetime Tax-Free Wealth, The Real Estate Investor's Guide to the 1031 Exchange. But if you go to the back jacket, the very first line of that says, it starts with a dream and then you find a way. Mm-hmm. And that's really just another way of saying, what's the why? Yep. For us, what was the dream that made this whole thing work? And why am I even talking on your show today? So I am a frustrated, lifelong real estate investor. I never met a deal I didn't like or want to try to do, or tried to do, and it's just been part of my DNA. I just love all things real estate, and I'm an accountant, so I get that tax nerdy side of me that (laughs) says, you know what, it's just as important how you sell real estate as it is how you buy real estate when it comes to making lifetime wealth. And we found that out as we were working towards our why. Uh, My wife and I were in Denver, Colorado, newly married, double income, no kids in the mid nineties. And this magical thing happened, Jason. We had our first child. And it was like, oh my gosh, what just happened here? Life is never gonna be the same. Just like John Denver said, we threw away the TV. All we did was just wanted to look at this little thing all day long. And it really made us realize that the greatest commodity we had was not fame, power, power, position, wealth. It was time. And there was no way to get more time. So we had to find ways to maximize the time that we were going to have with our children as they started to come. So at that point in time, we were both in different careers. Um, but somebody said, let's just invest in real estate. It'll be fun. It'll be easy. Somebody said, um, and that's what we decided to do was to become real estate investors and use that as a way to buy a sailboat, move on to a sailboat and raise our children as deck monkeys on the wild open ocean. Cause we thought that'd be cheap. I mean, I'm sailboats don't take any gas, right? So that's yeah. what we thought. That was the dream. That was the why. So ready, fire, aim, Dave went and bought a duplex. And I fixed it up. And I put a renter in it. And then I sold it. 
and I made a bunch of money and it was awesome. And we all said, yep, this is going to be easy. And then at the end of the year, my accountant said, hey, Dave, you know, you're going to owe $30,000. And I said, what? That's not part of the plan. That's yeah. not how this is supposed to work. That's going to slow us down too much. And it was all because I had to pay tax on that incredible profit that resulted from a lot of hard work on my part. Yeah. And it was right at that time that because of the other side of my life, the accounting side, I discovered the 1031 exchange, which for those of your listeners that don't know what it is, allows you to sell investment real estate and then go buy new investment real estate and not have to pay the tax in between. You get to instead use that tax to buy more real estate. Mm -hmm. Now, that $30,000 check that I didn't have to write 35 years ago, if I would have been able to invest that at that moment in new real estate, making me 10% a year for 35 years, how much money would I have now just from that one transaction? Right. Crazy to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Still keeps yeah. me up at night. <laughs> so that was the that was the start. From that moment on, we said, oh my gosh, this is the way to do it. And this is what we'll do. And without thinking twice, every other real estate we have made move we have made has been with that specific goal in mind to de to indefinitely defer paying tax, to use the tax to purchase more real estate. And by doing so in 10 years, we were able to purchase a 53 foot sailboat with tax free dollars because there's some conversion in there. And we were able to raise our four children on that sailboat, living off of the income from our vacation rental portfolio. That was the why. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot because it's, it's a, important piece to me, but it was definitely, you know, when my son was born that I realized you're sort of flip everything that you think is important <laughs> up until that point and realize that, that, you know, time is, is like by far the most important thing that you have. And it's, it's a funny thing because the, I always look back and I'm like, I wasted a lot of time. Like, like I had my kids in my forties. And so like, I, I'm like, what was I doing? Like what all the time now that I put, put towards them and, and now like building a real estate portfolio and things like that. I was like, I wasted a lot of time. Hopefully someone will learn from that lesson from me, but, but yeah, it, it you realize like, I don't, I don't look back and think, man, I wasted money on this or this or this. I think. I wasted time I could have been you know, sort of making like building for the future. So I think it's uh it's 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 really a certainly a um you know a life changing moment when when you have children <clears throat> and it impacts what you you know decisions you make from there. Yeah, it's uh we've got a mantra in our family that is memories over money. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we discount money. Because let's face it, it is a lot easier. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it's yeah. sure a lot easier to be happy if you've yeah. got the money. So we yeah. choose memories over money, but then we take a step back and we say, okay, in our business dealings, what's going to be the best way to facilitate getting these memories by generating the greatest amount of income with the least amount of effort and time? Yeah. And so that was kind of where we landed and uh, it worked for us. And along the way, we started doing it for others. And it's been a fun ride to be a qualified intermediary for 1031 exchanges for folks doing exactly what we wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. I it, I, I think taking an experience like that and, and you sort of rolling it into something that you can pass on to others is, is a, you know, smart move and, and, really great way to give back. Can you tell people, I mean, I think a lot of our uh, real estate investor listeners would know what a 1031 exchange is, but just to make sure that 
um, it is said for people listening. Will you kind of explain what that means and, and some of the rules around it? Yeah, nothing new under the sun. It's actually part of the original tax code. The reason why I was a dope and didn't know about it was because there was a 30-year lawsuit that was just in the middle of being settled where the IRS lost. How often does that happen, right? Yeah. And at that moment in 1996, people like you and I, regular investors, were going to be able to take advantage of this. And what it is, is it's a, simply a process where you use the services of an unrelated third party called the qualified intermediary, someone like us. And all you do, your actions are no different. You sell a piece of investment in real estate. You're within the, the, the realm of the process. You buy a piece of investment in real estate and you get to indefinitely defer paying that tax. As long as any time you sell that real estate and do another 1031 exchange, you'll never pay the tax. As long as you hold on to that real estate, you'll never pay the tax. As long as any time you convert the property from investment into your primary residence, you'll never pay the tax. I know, I saw your eyes open I didn't know, right there. I didn't know that part, yeah. Well, that was how we bought the <laughs> sailboat because we would convert investment real estate that we had 1031 exchange into, into our primary residence. Once we'd lived in it the right amount of time, then we were able to take a portion of that money tax-free. And so by the time we'd done that five or six times, moving our portfolio from Denver to Connecticut to Florida, we had enough tax-free money to buy the boat. Everything else was still tax-deferred. And then that's what bought the vacation rental portfolio. So that was how we kind of two-furred to get some of it tax-free, some of it tax-deferred. And then here's the final benefit. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say it, but it is. If you die owning the real estate, I mean, you kind of understand why I say, is that really a benefit? But we're <laughs> all heading there. So let's see how we can make the best of it. If you die owning that real estate, your heirs inherit that real estate as if they paid market value for it on the day you die. So all of that tax that we've been deferring over the decades, when we pass away, will go to our children tax-free. We'll never pay it. They'll never pay it. It's truly tax-free. So it's an opportunity. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a microwave game. It's not, you do, you don't do it quick, but it's the long haul. Yeah. If you set your mind to this strategy, you could live a life of never paying a penny in tax on real estate sales, and you will end up living off of that money, generating tons of wealth, and then finally leaving it all to your heirs tax-free. just doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know you said you sort of <clears throat> called it a benefit. I was actually going to ask you about that. If, if uh, <laughs> you know, I know if I've heard the, what's the name? There's like a name that a, they use. Yeah. It's called a step up in basis. Yeah. And well, there's like some funny colloquial name, like, I don't know, bye, 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 and then die or so. I, I don't remember oh, exactly. Defer, def, uh, it's called swap till you drop. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. I actually use this in uh, in a lot of my education. We teach people about the four Ds of 1031 investing. And the first D is defer because what we talked about at the very beginning, that gets mm -hmm. you started generating right. compounding interest, yeah. whether it's for two years or 30 years. You want to start that. The second D is to defer because you can use the 1031 exchange wherever you find the market in its cycle. Is it time to sell out of a high appreciation state and into where there's more cash flow? Is it time to sell single family and buy multifamily? Is it time to move from active to passive? All of that can be done because the 1031 exchange allows you to sell any type of investment real estate anywhere in the United States and purchase any other type anywhere. The third D is also defer. So we got three defers, right? Because you could use the 1031 exchange 
wherever you're at in your personal life cycle. We needed to buy a boat. Couldn't tip 31 into a boat because it's not real estate. Mm -hmm. So we took the opportunities to defer until we converted the properties into our primary residences. Moving towards retirement. That's a great plan to create your retirement job. Simply have a series of 1031 properties lined up, slowly convert them to invest up to your primary residence every few years. There's your retirement job. Um, the fourth D is what we exactly talked about right there, which is to finally die and leave the properties to your heirs. So in my world, it's defer, 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 and then die. I mean, it's a, it sounds a little morbid, but the, the reality is it's, it's going to happen. And, uh, and I think the, the, the main point to remember with something like that is that sometimes people want to give or sell their real estate holdings to their children before they die. And I, and that's, I know that's like a, a big, you know, sort of mistake, but a lot of people kind of fall into that, um, in, in. I, I don't know if they get bad advice or what, or they just think it makes sense, but yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that <laughs> before it happens because then you have that, all of that tax burden come up. <clears throat> right. I, I don't know if it's bad advice because there's so much that goes in to estate planning, but yeah. certainly creating entities and then giving your children ownership of those entities, those kinds of things that you do before you die can really exacerbate a tax issue yep. when you die. Of course, the nice thing is you don't care because you're gone, but your <laughs> kids have to deal with it. Yep. And uh, honestly, hopefully they will. This is the, this is the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the kinder side of things. Hopefully they will appreciate the emphasis doing during your life with them on mm -hmm. memories over money. And if they end up paying some tax, they won't mind. But wouldn't yep. it be nice if they could always think, dang, mom and dad sure did it right. Yep. We got all this property we don't have to pay tax on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What are the uh, the parameters on a 1031 exchange for, for people to kind of understand? I know there's there's time frames and things like that uh, after, uh, after selling your asset. Yeah, they all kind of shape the whole way you go about it depending upon what you're trying to do. So we mentioned that it could be any type of real estate anywhere else. You can change types. When you, and it starts with, it's kind of backwards because you don't think about making the money when you buy, it's when you sell. So starting with the day of the sale, you've got 45 more days. That's it to identify your potential replacement problems. You've got a total of 180 days to close. That's usually not such a big deal. Unless you're looking at buying some new construction, that's not going to be completed for a while. But that 45 days can really creep up on people. And depending upon where the market is, can cause you problems. Uh, you know, three or four years ago, you remember what it was like. Uh, nobody could find anything because inventory was so uh, short and there was demand was so high. So people would say, well, I'm scared to sell because I can't find anything to buy. So my advice always was, when you're gonna do a 1031 exchange, do the hard thing first. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of that first. Is the most difficult thing you're gonna do, find a new property to buy, then do that first. Get your property under contract during the 45 day period, or maybe even before you close the sale of your property. I can't tell you how many clients I had that are your next door neighbors out there in LA who did this exact thing. Now, sometimes they would have to go to some great lengths to get their new property under contract, non-refundable earnest money, cash offers, whatever it took, but they got their new property under contract. Then they listed their LA property for sale and got 20 offers over asking the first day it was on the market all cash, seven-day close. Yeah. Well, that worked out perfect, didn't it? But they took care of the hard thing first. As we move more into a balanced market, 
or even maybe in some cases a seller's, a buyer's market, do the hard thing first. Get your new property under your old property under contract to sell. Then yeah. go find your new property. That's how you can take advantage of the time frames. Uh, the rest of it is kind of nuanced nuts and bolts. Uh, you have to use the QI. You can't do it yourself. We have to be involved prior to the closing of the sale. And then uh, the title holder on the old property, whoever it is who's reporting it on their tax return, has to do that on the new property. That's those kind of things where when you're dealing with lots of entities, we as your QI can help sort that out for you. It's not a problem. The other biggest uh, requirement, the only other one, and it's probably the one that gets misunderstood the most, is the reinvestment requirements. If you want to defer all tax, you have to do two things. You have to purchase at least as much real estate as you sold in terms of dollar amount, your net sale. And you have to use whatever proceeds were generated from that sale in your purchase. You don't just reinvest the profit because what the IRS says, if all you put in is the profit, you're not actually putting in the profit. You're putting in your original capital. And the yeah. difference between what you sold and what you bought, that's the profit. So they're going to make you pay if you don't do those two things. But within those two things, there's some pretty big opportunities. For one thing, you could sell one property and buy two. Mm -hmm. or three or four. You could take multiple properties and combine them to purchase one larger property. As long as you purchase at least as much as your net sale, and as long as you use all the proceeds, you'll do for all tax. And that's the 1031 exchange. Yeah, I mean, 10,000 pages of case law says that, yes, it's more expensive, it's more complicated than that, but that's the job of the QI. Yeah. It really should not be that any more difficult than that for you. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. And, and, and to be clear, uh, the part that you're talking about, sort of the, the you know, proceeds versus profit, ultimately, and it, and it all needing to be handled by QI, ultimately, that the, you're not going to see any money, right? Be, because of these rules, you're not, you're not going to touch the money. It's going to go to the QI on the, in the interim. And then it all has to go into the additional property. So the the idea is like if if you if you want to take cash out from a sale, you might not do a 1031 exchange. However, there's other ways to get cash out of property, which is, you know, kind of what you uh I think touched on a little bit earlier with, you know, lines of credit and uh all kinds of different ways to, to is refinance, I guess, is not necessarily a um, capital event or a taxable event, if, I, if I'm if i understanding correctly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, you can take money out. I want to make sure that I don't leave people the impression they absolutely can't. You can't take money out. But any dollar you take out of the exchange, you pay tax on that amount. So sure. a lot of people do what's called a partial exchange. Okay. Because uh, they need money to pay for college or something. And so they'll do it that way. Or they'll do what you said, which I love this, the refinance after a 1031 exchange. Because that's not a taxable event. So you put all your money back into, now, they enter the new real estate, and then you do a refinance, and then you can take and do whatever you want with that new money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great opportunity. Now, at the very beginning, before we had the green room, before we came out, I kind of teased you on how we could do that with syndications. Yeah. You want to talk about that now? I do. Your folks yeah. are going to love I, this. Definitely, uh, definitely on the list of questions. So, yeah. Let, let, uh, well, how does it feel about this syndication? When you buy a syndication, typically, you're not buying real estate. Mm -hmm. You're buying an investment in an entity that owns real estate, whether it's an LLC or a limited partnership. So the 1031 exchange doesn't work for that because you have to sell real estate, buy real estate. Now, a syndicator, like in your projects, I don't know if you've got, do you let, allow certain 1031 investors to buy tenants in common interest? I 
I have been uh, a part of deals where that has happened. I have not been the sponsor for, I haven't actually had to like navigate setting that up. Oh, yeah, I mean, they're very complicated, but yeah. it can't be done. Right. But because they're so complicated, uh, what you're actually doing is the 1031 investor sold their old real estate and they bought a percentage of the new real estate owned by the syndication. So they mm -hmm. own part of the real estate and the syndicator owns part of the real estate. Because those are so complicated, the syndicators will typically have a pretty steep minimum of yeah. 500,000 or a million. So yeah, it's kind of tough to do, uh, but it can be done. Now, the second way that you could use 1031 with the syndication is if the syndicator themselves sells the property mm -hmm. and has their new target already lined up, they can simply do a, a 1031 exchange with the entire property. All of the investors, because they're part of that LP or LLC, go forward into the new property. All of the tax on profit is deferred indefinitely again. If there are investors that want to cash out at that time, that's when it's a relatively simple matter for the syndicator to simply find replacement investors. And instead of them investing with the, with the syndicator, they will buy the membership interest of the investor that wants to get bought out mm -hmm. easily enough. Yeah. But here's my favorite way to do it. And let's, let's use an example here. Let's say you're selling a property for $500,000 and there is $200,000 of debt on it. So your debt proceeds are $300,000 and you've got to purchase with that $300,000, $500,000 worth of real estate. And you really, really want to go into this syndication, but the syndication won't accept $31. So what you do is you buy two properties. You buy one property for $250,000 cash. Mm -hmm. And then you use the other $50,000 to go buy another $250,000 property with an 80% mortgage. Easy enough to do. Yeah. So did you complete your 1031 exchange and defer all tax? You sure did. But what do you have now? Well, you've got one property that's got leverage and it's hopefully doing it its thing. But you've got another property that you own free and clear. So basically you've recession proved your portfolio, haven't you? Mm -hmm. But remember, you wanted to go into a syndication. So why don't you refinance that property and take yeah. that $200,000 and then invest those tax-free dollars into the syndication? And now what do you have when the dust settles? Two properties with decent leverage on them, making money as rentals, giving you depreciation, appreciation, everything. And you've got a $200,000 investment in a syndication. That's an absolute passive investment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I think it's the, the great thing about real estate. One of the great things is the ability to be very creative and find, you know, sort of all these different, I don't even want to say loopholes because they're, they're part of the tax code. They're legal. Everything's, everything's there. So it's like, just, it's, it's just a matter of knowing that you're, you know, capable of doing that. Even, even if you're not trying to be, you know, like a professional investor and you have your own personal home, you lived in a long time, it's got, you know, now it's got a lot of uh, equity in it and you go to sell it. I know that like to an extent you get to, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but like write off some of that equity as a, as a, as your own personal home. But if you have a lot of, uh, appreciation in your property, some of that you're going to potentially have to pay tax on, but you could use that instead in, in, you know, 1031 into your next property or do, do a strategy like you just talked about so that you don't get taxed on even whatever the difference is above, you know, kind of the the, the um, homestead exclusion. Yeah, exactly. We don't like the word loophole. It makes me right. feel like I have to go take a shower after this is over. But a mentor of mine challenged me one time to stop looking at the tax code 
as the way the government uses to get your money from you. And instead, look at the tax code as a behavior incentivizer. Mm-hmm. And you'll see if you do it from, though, from that perspective, what behaviors the IRS, the government loves. They love people that buy real estate because that's what grew our country. And that's why 1031 is part of the original tax code. Because way back in 1920, we needed farms and we needed agriculture. But everybody who had these 160 acre homesteads could not sell them and buy bigger farms because they couldn't pay the tax and they didn't have enough left to go buy the farm. So they couldn't grow. These young farmers that wanted to become farmers, there was nothing to buy because the small farms weren't being sold. So the IRS incentivized farmers to sell their real estate and grow. And they did that with the 1031 exchange. So whether it's the 1031 exchange, depreciation, or like you mentioned, the homestead exception, the primary residence exclusion, those are all ways that the government incentivizes you to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. And if you do it the right way, you're rewarded. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I think it's, and these are things that, you know, talking to, to folks like yourself and, and other experts at these strategies. It's just, it's, it's so helpful and, and kind of eye-opening at what is actually available out, available out there for people to do in ways to, to, you know, essentially not be losing, well, in California, half your salary uh, from a tax perspective. So there's, there's ways to, um, you know, be advantageous with that money and, 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 because again, you're incentivized to do certain things. Dave, um, let me, I wanna switch gears. I wanna ask you the questions I ask every guest. And the first one is always, you know, what is your why? I know we talked about it some, I wanted to give you the chance to kind of expand on that uh, if you'd like to, in terms of, um, you know, I think I, I've always found that my why and, and, and a lot of my guests' why has uh, shifted over time, right? So, you know, you mentioned when you're, your uh, first child was born. Now, now time is the is the real valuable commodity. I don't know if you have any um, have had any shifts in in you. So your your approach to your why over the years. You know, it's uh, I firmly believe that when when God created me, I I believe the words that He said, which were that children are a gift, and they're a gift that He's given to me, and so for me, the why of time spent with them to instill in them the same values, to raise them, to enjoy them, to share life with our creator with them. That always has, it always will be my why. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that one, that one definitely isn't going anywhere for me either. It's, it's, you know, maybe I might add things to it, but it's always, you know, kids and family first. So, um, I love that. Um, Tell us something about yourself that uh, isn't common knowledge, a special skill, a hobby, um, anything to let listeners know you a little better. Isn't common knowledge. My goodness, I wrote a book. I'm an open book. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's in it. Uh, you know what a lot of people uh, don't know is that I actually started out life as an adult as a college volleyball coach. Oh, cool. And I did that for a number of years and actually had quite a bit of success uh, before I discovered the joys and a heartache of real estate investing and accounting work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's super cool. I, I, I mean, we just had the Olympics just finished, so I've actually watched quite a bit of volleyball recently. It's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite parts of the Summer Olympics. So that's really neat. Um, when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, what's the best way? As you can tell, just from that little bit today that we went into, this is something where the IRS has to let you do it but they're certainly not going to advertise it or teach you. Yeah. So we realized we needed to create an avatar persona that was going to be based on education. So it's very easy. Simply go to the1031investor.com and you've got access to our YouTube channel, which is YouTube backslash the1031investor. 65 videos, I think, and counting on every topic you can imagine. 
and they're short videos. Nothing long, because I have the attention span of a golden retriever <laughs> with memory loss. And that's how I do my YouTubes. So you're never going to be bored. They're always going to be quick. Access to calculators, to articles, to free consultations with us. We know it's not easy to understand or to do. So we want to make it easy for you. The 1031 Investor. Dot com. Perfect. And we'll, we'll have that in the show notes for sure. Um, my final question for you, uh, you know, as someone who is an expert in 1031 exchanges also has done uh, a, a great deal of real estate investing yourself, what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to get started? They're um, kind of interested in, you know, they hear your story and they're like, that sounds like a great strategy for me. What, where, what would you uh, point them to get started? Uh, in terms of resources or just philosophy? Either. Uh, whatever, whatever resonates with you. Uh, well, resources, there's two books that I read that, strangely enough, they impacted my entire life, but I didn't read them until I was well into my investing career. The first one is called Whatever Happened to Penny Candy? It's by a guy named Richard Barbary. I know. You go, where did that come that from, one. right? <laughs> Whatever happened to Penny Candy? And he also wrote a follow-up book called The Clipper Ship Strategy. Richard Barbary, they're part of the Uncle Eric series, written for middle schoolers, which is why I was able to understand them. But they are the best primers on inflation and its impact on monetary policy, that's what it happened to Penny Candy, and locating sectors and regions to invest in. Whatever, whatever, uh, I'm not aware of, the Clipper Ship Strategy, those two books will teach you everything you need to know to understand when to invest and where to invest. I mean, hands down, you'll laugh when you see the covers, but there's a lot of meat inside them. Um, so those two. Philosophically, so many of us, you're probably like me, unless you were born with a silver spoon. We started with plenty of energy and no money and no yeah. brains too, but that's a different <laughs> story. The temptation is to generate the quick money, to fix and flip, to buy and sell, to keep moving because it feels like Velocity is profit. But when you're a 1031 investor, velocity is the enemy of lifetime gain. If you will slow down and be patient, appreciation, depreciation, the 1031 exchange, the opportunities to let tenants pay the mortgage for you, all of those things will add up slowly at first but over time it accelerates. And so be patient and looking at it as a long game has is, is been the key to our success. Yeah, absolutely agree. That, that's why I get really excited about young people sort of who are recognizing these strategies early in life and, and, and you know, eat, whether they have the money to invest at that moment, like asking the questions kind of, how do I set myself up for this long-term success? Because you really do have to think about it from a, you know, what's this gonna look like in 10, 20, 30 years from now, not what's it gonna look like in three months. So it's definitely um, a, a, a long-term game, but a bit of <laughs> nearly, uh, nearly impossible to fail at if you think about it from a long-term game. So it's, it's pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. good. Kind of funny you say it actually exactly the same way. I don't know if you were invested, how long you've been investing for. I'm so old that I can remember this time called the Great Recession mm -hmm. of 2008. Yeah. And uh, I just called it the dark days. It was, <laughs> it was bad. But what's funny it wasn't is. wasn't a good time, no. <laughs> no. But what's funny is that every one of my investors who did not have to sell their properties because of the credit crunch. Every one of them are multi, multi, multi billionaires many times over. Because yep. that's all they had to do was weather that storm. And you know how long that storm actually lasted for? A couple of years was all. Yeah. Rents came right back up. 
opportunities to buy came right back up. And they did quite well for themselves because yeah. they were prepared and could wait. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You just you have to weather the storm. We're weathering a storm right now and it's you know, but the the other side is you know, it, it as long as you don't sell, you haven't lost any money. You're really just kind of everything's on paper. So it, it's kind of a um, I don't want to say that it's overblown, but certainly uh, sometimes weathering the storm is very hard. So it's it's a position that you need to kind of recognize. But it, yeah, it's it's that's it. It's just, you know, to, in 2008, it feels like a long time ago, it wasn't that long ago. And, and you can see what see what came of it, what you know, the rebound that had that happened. So um, it's it's just these are cycles. You know, I challenge people, if you want to really see the, the right perspective, stop looking at Zillow hope and stop looking at your net worth and instead look at your bank account. I, my net worth went down so much. There was a negative in front of the number at times, but my bank account never changed. Yep. And a few years later, that's when it recovers, just like you said. Yeah. It's just kind of depressing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we would all love it to just keep going up, right? We would always love our investments to always go straight up. But it's just never, it, whether you're talking real estate, uh, uh, stocks, crypto, what, whatever you're into, it's it's never going to be a straight line up. You just have to recognize yeah, that. I know. It's I, game. Warren Buffett said this. Warren Buffett said why is everybody so excited when the market's going up? That just means I have to pay more for stuff. I'd yep. rather see it go down and then I can buy low. I actually don't mind it when real estate goes down because yep. I can recognize when to buy and what to buy. And I know that it's always going to recover over time. Absolutely right. Yep, absolutely. Well, Dave, this was awesome. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think um, th th this is a very important strategy for people to understand with the 1031 exchange. And, and um, you know, as you mentioned, be thinking of ahead of time. It's it's kind of you don't you don't sell your property and then go, oh, no, I, I should have <laughs> done this. You have to you have to think about it, uh, you know, kind of in advance. So thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing everything that you did. I, I do really appreciate everything. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your day out there. Yeah. And folks listening, uh, I know you're going to love this one. Connect with Dave and please like, rate and review the show so we get more great guests. Thank you all for listening. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why?